Good evening, comrades, and welcome to uh, the latest uh, session in the LLA's educational series on Marx and Marxism. And uh, this evening's session is going to be led by uh, Ollie Perkins, who's going to be talking about Marx, uh, nature and ecology. And I suppose because of uh, the, um, the issue of the climate crisis and indeed a growing awareness of ecological and environmental issues, this is now uh, in many ways quite a central area uh, for the labor movement and indeed uh, you know, for wider society. Um, I, uh, I well recall in the late 60s when uh, I first heard the word environment uh, as referring to something more than just the description of an immediate surroundings and the, the idea of, uh, of pollution. Uh, this is the uh, era of uh, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. And for those of us who became interested in politics in the late 60s, it was uh, one of the issues that uh, began to be important. But that, of course, is much wider now. And, um, and so uh, tonight's session is looking at uh, Marx's contribution uh, to, the, to, to these ideas. There's been something of a debate uh, really in the last 20 or 30 years uh, amongst Marxists of all stripes uh, about the relationship of Marx to the idea of nature, towards ecology, with, um, with, with many people discovering or emphasizing uh, the ecological Marx and that in particular his understanding of the the uh, depredations that capitalism creates in the environment. And of course, in the world in which Marx is growing up uh, and uh, reaching maturity and adulthood and so forth, he's witnessing industrialization, he's witnessing those sorts of um, depredations really at first hand. And uh, so he's got plenty of raw material. And it's very clear that capitalism is despoiling the earth and um, is, um, is causing a great deal of environmental damage. But of course, the, 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 the debate's much wider than that, and it's about how Marx sees man's relationship to nature. Indeed, in, in many ways, it's, it's really quite fundamental to Marx's conception of, of human beings, particularly of uh, uh, man making himself, and that uh, economic activity and indeed creation in the widest sense is quite central to human existence. So um, without more ado, I'm gonna hand over to Ollie. We're gonna have the usual um, pattern of, uh, of a talk for around about 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and then uh, we'll go straight into uh, questions and discussion. Um, so uh, off you go, Ollie, and uh, looking forward to this talk a great deal. Okay, uh, <laughs> thanks for hyping that up. Yeah, good introduction, uh, Kevin. Um, I do, um, uh, I, I would say, yeah, also um, being of uh, the uh, slightly younger generation, um, climate change, global warming is something that's um, sort of hammer, hammered into you from an early age, uh, almost, uh, you know, as soon as you enter. Uh, uh, education it's a sort of a ever present you know global warming fossil fuels <laughs> litter picking <laughs> all sorts of stuff like that um but yeah i um i want to um things um obviously you mentioned the the the, the climate movement is obviously something that's of growing importance you know uh, pre-lockdown you've got the um climate strikes and everything something seems to be going on every week um unlike other things like you know trade union struggles which seem to be in a bit of a lull at the moment um also um yeah marks on ecology <laughs> so last week um you know, there was a lot of talk about uh, lack of uh, quoting marks well i don't know if uh, perhaps we could if it made it onto the website or if we could get it put in chat, but I did, uh, I <laughs> went and made a very long, big uh, load of reference sheet of uh, all the various Marx quotes, etc. I'll be using during the talk. So you uh, won't have to worry about that. Um, so the question of, um, of um, you know, Marx perhaps as the, uh, as an eco warrior is, uh, <laughs> it, 
whether or not you uh, agree, perhaps it's overplayed or not, is something we can discuss. But um, what I want to illustrate to you is um, uh, that it does make up an important part of Marx's contribution, even if, you know, relative size wise, it might not be, uh, <laughs> might not take up as much room as the economic stuff, but it's certainly intertwined in uh, all the various arguments. If you look deep enough, well, not even that deep, it's, it's there. Um, and yeah, just before I, I get off um, starting, um, uh, a lot of this, <laughs> a great deal was inspired, if perhaps it's the wrong word, but um, uh, uh, the uh, a contribution made by a comrade at the Labouring Crisis What's Next uh, conference a few weeks ago, um, I'm paraphrasing, but along the lines of, you know, with all this um why bother with all this mark stuff perhaps we should um you know tail the eco warriors um that's where the movement is um and i guess what i want to show is perhaps that um um it's there Mar marxism has um you know earned its place within the ranks of um the green movement shall we say but also it's got some answers to it can answer questions that other you know non non-marxist analyses um can't can't do that um okay so um i wanted to start off perhaps before we get into the sort of um deep you know um capitalist uh, analysis of capitalism and nature i think um it's perhaps important to um look at the question of um what separates um man humans um from nature um it's sort of a background issue, but it's it's important, obviously, when we're talking about nature, to know um, uh, to 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 know <laughs> what we're dealing with here. Marx is um, often portrayed as a bit of a grubby materialist. Um, you know, um, you get things in Capital where he's you know got his accountancy hat on and he's just reeling off quarters of wheat, bushels of. Uh, whatever you know tons of steel um but actually um the relation of um, man and nature is um something that's uh, deep within the marxist um uh, thought um obviously um city did his doctoral thesis i think in uh, was it epicurean um, greek uh, philosophy i think um, so, you know, uh, Greek dialectics and stuff like that, and the relation to nature is um, important there. Um, so, um, in Capital, this is what he has to say on, on the question. Labour is, in the first place, a process in which both man and nature participate, in which, uh, and in which man, uh, of his own accords, regulates and controls uh, the material reactions between himself and nature. He opposes himself to nature as one of her own forces, setting in motion arms and legs, heads and hands, um, the natural forces of his own body in order to appropriate nature's productions in a form adapted to his own wants. By thus acting on the external world and changing it, uh, he at the same time changes his own nature. Um, so there's uh, quite a few interesting tidbits in that, particularly about, uh, you know, sort of um, opposing nature as one of its own forces. It's, um, we're not, we are separate in nat uh, from nature in a way, but um, it's uh, sort of an internal separation, if you will. Um, and this sort of, also uh, goes on to um, a, uh, a, a few key arguments by uh, Engels, particularly in dialectics of nature and um, um, the role of um, labor in the transition from ape to man, in which um, this dialectic between um, man and nature um, and uh, some, some of the, um, you know, um, nature uh, and the environment in which we live changing and adapting uh, man he uses the example of um, the hand and uh, also uh, the voice box getting language um, but also um, man's uh, changing of nature that's something we're gonna uh, i'm gonna look at 
Um, so also on the um, on the question of um, of um, uh, on this passage, uh, we also get this as a sort of a famous um, passage from uh, Capital, um, uh, and it's um, it, it sort of encapsulates this sort of argument, if you will. Uh, a spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is the architect raises his structure in the imagination before he erects it in reality. And at the end of the labor process, we get the results that already existed in his, uh, in his imagination. Um, or in the imagination of the labour at its com commencement. He not only affects a change in form in the, uh, in the material on which he works, but he also realises a purpose of his own and uh, that gives the law to his modus operandi and to which he must subordinate his will. So uh, we get... Um, a sort of um, important distinction there, and it's it's a it's a useful one of um, conscious labour. So we can think of animals doing all sorts of um, labour, and um, uh, <laughs> you know, um, birds building nests, ants building you know ant hills and stuff like that. Um, it gives the example of bees um, and spiders. Um, they make all sorts of uh, constructions um, within the natural world, but uh, what differentiates them from um, from humans? Um, and you know, um, so it's, it's it's a useful distinction is that of conscious conscious labour planning. Um, does uh, what 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 level of conscious planning can we um, can we uh, see in um, in nature? Okay, it also, um, uh, yeah, um, it also sort of brings us to the argument about um, about subordinating uh, nature, <laughs> subordinating nature to our will. Um, this is something that's definitely covered um, by Engels and um, uh, in, uh, in uh, dialectics of nature and he gives some quite prophetic uh, you know um, uh, analyses of the situation particularly to do with this dialectic of um, of um, man and nature and how they affect each other and in turn change one another um, okay um, so on to the, the the various sort of victories of man over nature if you will um, man alone has succeeded in impressing his stamp on nature, not only by shifting plant and animal species from one place to another, but also, uh, but also by uh, so altering the aspect and climate of his own dwelling place, and even the plants and animals themselves, uh, that the consequences of his activity can, uh, can disappear only with the general ex extinction of the terrestrial globe. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> again, I'll uh, let you read into that what you will, but um, certain things, you can think of things like, uh, you know, nuclear waste, etc. Man has really uh, left his imprint on the planet and uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, changed it um, almost unrecognizably um, from the sort of uh, the earth we inherited, as it were. Um, okay. But as part of this dialectic, um, Engels also um, um, illustrates some consequences, perhaps, of, um, of said um, victory over nature. Uh, let us not, however, flatter ourselves uh, over much on the account of human victories over nature. For each such victory, uh, nature takes its revenge on us. Each victory, it is true, uh, in the first place brings about the ex uh, results we expected, but in the second and third places, it is quite different unforeseen effects, on, uh, which only too often cancel the first. Um, so um, the flip side of the antagonism, if you will, is um, 
<laughs> is that uh, often as a result of the changes um, we inflict on nature, um, they too can then have sort of disastrous results. Think, for example, you know, you cut down a bunch of, um, of, of trees, and what happens when it rains? Well, there aren't any trees there to sort of, you know, soak up everything. You end up getting sort of horrible flooding and um, all that sort of thing. Um, but we can also read um, uh, further into that. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. And <laughs> if you will, you know, there's almost that sort of um, a bit of a, a sort of formulation in the communist manifesto about you know um digging our uh, making our own grave diggers perhaps not only in the um in the in the worker uh, in the in the proletariat but also uh, uh, the development of productive forces that capitalism creates also um is um, destroying itself at a, an unprecedented rate okay um so I won't go too much into um, the sort of labor theory of value and economics of things. I'll perhaps leave that to the end if I have time, but judging by the clock, I don't think I have. Um, maybe that's something we can look at in the discussion. Um, but um, uh, contrary to popular belief, as I've mentioned before about, you know, grubby, grubby materialist Marx, um, um, it's um, it's not part of the Marxist analysis just to see nature as um, you know something um, something we inherit and uh, labor being the uh, the only um, special thing. Um, labor being the source of all value is a common sort of sort of misformulation, if you will, and it often leads to sort of economistic readings of things, if you will. Um, Okay, so um, uh, it's a good um, part, I think, in, I think it's in the uh, introduction to um, the part played by labor in the transition of ape to man. Um, labor is the source of all wealth, the political economists assert. And it really is the source next to nature, which supplies it with the material, uh, the material that it converts into wealth. Um, and uh, Engels goes on to talk about, um, you know, um, how labor created man himself, etc. But, um, but uh, I, <laughs> I think we get the picture. Um, and, um, you know, uh, okay. Um, it's also important to know how um, capitalism treats uh, nature as a free gift. Um, so um, it has no value, if you will. Um, it, uh, it um, it's it's just something there that we can plunder at will, uh, almost a sort of a capitalist extension of the um, you know um, province go west sort of uh, be fruitful and multiply. This is more you know be profitable and accumulate, <laughs> if you will, is the sort of capitalist uh, mantra. Um, okay. Uh, and that continues to this very day. I'm looking here about, you know, um, neoclassical economists, you know, well into the um, uh, the noughties um, talking about free gifts of nature. So it's very much in their ideology. OK, so I want to just sort of um, shift tack and um, sort of um, uh, perhaps uh, disillusion or go into some illusions. Perhaps if we will um, close your eyes and imagine uh, nature, and I bet a few people, uh, if they were to do that, would um, think of, uh, you know, the countryside, rolling green hills, maybe a few, um, you know, hedges off in the distance with um, uh, <laughs> cows munching on grass. Um, but uh, how much of uh, that nature is really natural? And um, this is something Marx um, goes into particularly with, um, with agriculture and um, with, um, with animals. Um, the stuff that we deal with is, <laughs> is, uh, is uh, pretty fake if you think about it. Um, you know, our, our, uh, our black and white 
spotted cows are you know quite far away from their you know hairy horned uh, forest dwelling friends and uh, we can think of um, um, we can think of uh, you know chickens uh, how different they are from perhaps red forest fowl or something like that you know pumping out eggs uh, <laughs> every other day etc okay um in in capital um, marx did go into uh, this in in quite some detail um, plants and animals which we are accustomed to consider as products of nature maybe in their present form not only products say of last year's labor but the result of a gradual transformation continued through many generations under human control and uh, and though uh, and through the agency of human labor um so we get into this sort of you know fallacy of uh, <laughs> the countryside if you will uh, um and there's there's reasons for this um capitalist meddling of nature if you will um it is impossible of course to deliver a five-year-old animal before the end of five years um, but what is possible within certain limits is to prepare animals for the uh, for their fate more quickly uh, by new modes of treatment. This is precisely what Robert Bakewell managed to do. Previously, British sheep, just like French sheep as late as 1855, were not uh, ready for slaughter before the fourth or fifth year. Bakewell's system, uh, in Bakewell's system, uh, one-year-old sheep could be uh, already fattened and uh, in any case, they are fully grown before their second year has elapsed. By selective breeding, Bakewell um, reduced uh, the bone structure of his sheep to a minimum necessarily f uh, necessary for their existence. Um, okay, so um, we can look at uh, Bakewell and the <laughs> the, um, uh, the the construction of the modern day farm animal, if you will, capitalist construction. Um, the breeder can now. Uh, uh, sent uh, three to market in the same space and time that it formerly took him to prepare one. And if, uh, uh, and if they are not taller, they are broader, rounder, and have uh, uh, a greater development in those parts which give it the most flesh. Of bone, they have absolutely no greater amount than is necessary to support them. And uh, almost all their weight is pure meat. Uh, so that's, um, I think that's um, a lavernier. You better forgive my French pronounce, uh, pronunciation there, but um, so um, yeah, the first quote on capital and the um, passage from Lavernier and the R rural economy of England um, point to um, capitalist development um, altering nature, and we gotta say, well, you know, why? Um, well. It's pretty um, simple uh, economics, really, without getting into relative surplus value too much. If you can produce, you know, three times as much in the same space of time as another farmer can do, um, <laughs> that's three times the uh, potential profits and uh, there's potential there for you to, um, you know, employ more capital and um, get more money out of it or what have you. Um, okay. Um, so hence, that's why we can have lamb instead of mutton. Previously, we, we all used to eat mutton and uh, it was pretty tough and no one really liked it that much. But <laughs> but uh, now we've got a uh, cheap lamb that happens every spring and, um, and uh, is uh, nice and uh, cheap and fruitful. Well, OK, uh, someone put in the um, chat, I hope we'll get to uh, factory farming. That's exactly what you're going to get. Um, Marx, um, the eco warrior, as it were, uh, drenched in his green, you know, badges and um, out there on the street shouting. In these prisons, uh, animals are born and remain there until they are killed off. The question is whether or not uh, this system connected to the breeding system that grows animals in an abnormal way by aborting uh, bones in order to transform them into mere meat and bulk of, of fat. Whereas earlier, before 1848, animals remained active by staying under free air as much as possible, uh, will ultimately uh, result in serious deterioration of their life force, is the question. Um, 
and that's uh, uh, that, that's a quote from uh, Marx there in um, The Robbery of Nature, uh, Capitalism and the Ecological Rift. I, uh, yeah, okay, so um, um, so that's Marx on factory farming. He was uh, quite a, um, uh, not a big fan of sticking, um, you know, thought it was barbarous, you know, having these prisons for animals uh, it, uh, and producing them on a on a factory scale. Um, this um, this brings me into um, um, Liebig, um, who um, is a very interesting character and clearly had a um, uh, uh, an important effect on Marx. If not, you know, Marx certainly agreed with the um, the conclusions Liebig came to um, to do with um, capitalist uh, agriculture and its effect on nature. Um, he, he quotes him um, once or twice in Capital. Okay, so um, uh, Liebig's quite an interesting uh, character. Um, it's the man that gave us the Liebig uh, condenser, uh, if you're into chemistry, the vertical condenser column. Uh, he also um, uh, gave us the process that uh, gave us the stock pot, and uh, he was um, in, yeah. He was the man behind uh, removing uh, yeast from uh, fermentation products, and uh, so we have um, so we have marmite. So um, love him or hate him, Liebig uh, very much had a, 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 a an important effect, um, as it were. Um, Marx was very well read in sciences, you know, geology, um, etc., um, natural sciences. Okay. Um, Liebig um, had the law of um, compensation, or perhaps it's a substitution or replenishment, depending on your translation, if you will. Uh, as, essentially, um, the, the moral of the story is, is that farming um, the plants uh, from farming um, suck up nutrients from the soil. Um, and then if you take away the plants after you've harvested them, then um, you need to replenish the um, uh, the uh, the nutrients from the soil. Um, okay, um, so obviously under feudalism, you know, um, feudal modes of production, perhaps that wasn't so bad, but um, capitalism um, <laughs> sort of uh, made things uh, a bit more crazy. Um, uh, Lavernier, um, who I previously mentioned uh, was also a uh, an influential figure, but uh, perhaps uh, on the opposite uh, so side of the coin, if you will. He was a, a proponent of high industrial farming and the um, English model of mainly meat-based agriculture. Um, and this is what he has to say. Um, agriculture had decisively changed in the British Isles uh, from a natural uh, process into uh, more and more a manufacturing process. Each field will henceforth be a kind of machine. The steam engine sends forth columns. It uh, sends forth its columns of smoke over the green landscapes. Um, so, um, <laughs> true Victorian fashion, if you will. Everything becomes mechanized. Everything uh, has to have uh, smokestacks attached to it. And this very much um, reflects the sort of um, period in that sort of mid, um, uh, early mid um, 19th century in which uh, industrial agriculture becomes um, uh, pretty mental. Um, so that uh, brings us on to um, the fertilizers and um, um, uh, Liebig was um, quite, um, uh, quite vocal about um, the use of um, uh, guano, um, which uh, is a uh, uh, bird shite for the more colloquial uh, um, listener. Um, uh, upwards of uh, uh, 1.5 million metric tons of the stuff um, of Peruvian guano was imported to Great Britain and 2 million tons into Europe as a whole. Uh, uh yeah um okay so this um this was used um quite you know destructive heavy industrial farming uh, using uh, these artificial or these uh, fertilizers um to produce an extra 200 million qu uh, quarters of grain which by my calculations is 
10.16 million tons but um uh, it was uh, it was D-Day not uh, long ago, the anniversary. So if someone <laughs> wants to do their old money calculations, um, be my guest, uh, prove me wrong. Um, okay, uh, yes, um, that's what would have been produced um, uh, ex was produced extra. Um, that wouldn't have happened without the guano. Um, but it wasn't just this. Capitalism takes things to new heights. Um, why not a bit of grave robbing, as it were? Um, uh, Great Britain uh, robs all countries of the conditions of their fertility. She has already ransacked the fields of Leipzig, Waterloo and the Crimea for bones and consumed the accumulated skeletons of many generations in the Sicilian catacombs. Uh, we may say to the uh, world that she hangs like a vampire on the neck of Europe. Uh, she seeks out... See, seeks out its heart's blood without any necessity and without any permanent benefit uh, to herself. So um, you can, um, I, I'm sure people will be thinking uh, of the uh, passage from um, Capital in which Marx talks about, um, you know, Capital being dead labour, uh, vampire-like, um, uh, lives only by sucking living labour and lives more the more labour it sucks. Um, Yes, sorry. If you, if uh, if anyone's uh, eating, I would recommend perhaps the next section on the metabolic rift. Um, perhaps might want to put their meal aside, because um, um, Engels in particular gets quite vocal on this. Um, okay, so Marx never um, used the term metabolic rift. Um, it was sort of an ir irreversible or irreversible break, you know. Um, depending on your translation, if you will, it, it was a it was a a break, a separation of um, the natural um, uh, flow of nature. Uh, okay, um, so we get um, with um, the development of capitalist uh, of capitalism, um, something we've covered before and previously in. Uh, <laughs> um, in uh, in these talks, you know, the parcelization of land, um, growing out of uh, feudalism, new laws which enabled the uh, the um, dicing up of the commons um, and um, the creation of the you know tenant farmer. Um, this is um, this process um, again had its destructive effects on nature in the sense that. Um, now you had more people who were essentially kicked off of the land previously that they'd, they'd worked the land and they had this relation to nature um now however not only were a portion of their the fruits of their labor um alienated from them they were alienated from the means of production itself um this is pretty basic to capitalism you don't own the factory you don't have a say in how it's done you just work there and you get a wage at the end of it well um during this period we saw um particularly you know the sort of uh, sort of mid 19th century um is when um is when things uh, get pretty um, intense uh, but it goes a lot earlier um down to the uh, 18th century as well um, you get a lot of people crowded into cities and um, uh, the, the um, feudal landlords kicking out the peasants. Uh, okay, um, so uh, this is actually the bit in Capital where uh, Marx quotes Liebig, so I'm <laughs> trying to tie it all together here. Um, Large landed property reduces the agricultural population to a constantly falling minimum and it confronts it with a uh, constantly growing industrial population crowded together in large cities. It thereby creates conditions which cause an ir <laughs> irreparable break in the uh, coherence of social interchange prescribed by the uh, natural laws of life. It's the sort of um, thing I was saying earlier. As a result, the vitality of the soil is squandered and, um, and this... Uh, prodigally um, is carried by commerce uh, far beyond the borders of, of the particular state. Um, okay, so um, further on, we have um, 
cap uh, on the same sort of topic we have capitalist production by collecting the population into great centers and causing an ever increasing preponderance uh, of town population uh, onto the uh, on the one hand concentrates uh, the the historical uh, the historical motive power of society the laborers um, on the one hand and disturbs the circulation of matter between man and the soil i.e. prevents the return of soil of its elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing. It, it therefore violates the conditions necessary to lasting fertility of the soil. So that's where we get uh, that from. Uh, and uh, crucially, this is the point I bring up this whole topic. Um, and um, uh, <laughs> uh, what's uh, sort of crucial to the sort of metabolic rift argument is uh, is not just the expropriation of uh, or the, the the abuse <laughs> that we subjugate nature to. Um, uh, capitalism has done with you know um, industrial farming, um, ag uh, industrial fertilizers. Um, uh, that sort of thing, um, monoculture as well, getting into that. Um, it's also um, got a twofold effect of um, also alienating the labor as well, um, not just um, to the means of production, uh, but um, also uh, dumping the, us all into the uh, horrible cities <laughs> um, where we're alienated from nature. Um, as well as our, our labor. Okay, um, moreover, all progress in capitalistic agriculture is a process in the art, not only of robbing uh, the laborer, but of robbing the soil. All progress increasing, in increasing the fertility of the soil for a given time is a progress towards ruining the lasting uh, sources of that fertility. Okay, so um, this is where things get uh, rather um, vivid. Uh, and um, as commonly happens when people are talking about what Marx had to say on things, we often end up talking about what Engels had to say uh, more often than not. I think of the, um, of the uh, young Karl Marx is mostly about, is about Friedrich Engels mostly. Um, okay, uh, so a vivid, uh, if you will, illustration of this metabolic rift that Marx is talking about um, is, <laughs> uh, comes in the form of the condition of the working class in England. Um, so uh, my friends in Stockport, I was <laughs> always uh, very uh, fond of quoting Engels to them and uh, how he describes Stockport as the uh, dirtiest, grimiest uh, smoking hole he's ever seen, particularly viewed from the via, uh, when viewed from the viaduct. Uh, so I love rubbing that into them. But um, more uh, on the Manchester side of things, um, we get this, um, particularly his description of the rivers, um, the... Um, uh, well, Medlock and Irk. Um, along the River Irk, um, there are several tanneries which fill the whole neighbourhood with the stench of animal putrefaction. Um, he continues, and at the bottom uh, flows um, the river, uh, or rather stagnates the Irk, a narrow, coal black, foul smelling stream full of debris and refu uh, refuse in which it deposits on its shallow, shallower right bank in dry weather, a long string of the most disgusting blackish green slime pools uh, are left standing on its bank, from the depths of which bubbles and miasmic gas can constantly arise and give forth a stench unendurable even from the bridge 40 or 50 feet above the surface of the stream. But besides this, the stream itself is checked every few paces by high weirs, behind which slime and refuse accumulate and rot in thick masses. Above the bridge, the tanneries, bone mills and gas works from which all drains the ref uh, and refuse find their way into the Irk, which receives further the contents of all neighboring sewers and privies. Uh, it may easily be imagined, therefore, what sort of residue the stream deposits. <laughs> so uh, you thought Stockport was bad, uh, yeah. <laughs> My Manchester, central Manchester uh, took the biscuit there. Um, so uh, why have I just spent a few minutes grossing you out um, using up my precious final moments of time? Um, it's because of um, <laughs> it's because of this metabolic rift. Um, 
argument, um, the uh, uh, cap capitalist agriculture is extremely destructive. Um, we can talk about Ireland. That's a whole different, <laughs> that's a whole new level of uh, genocide and destruction when it comes to uh, agriculture. Um, but um, it also in the cities, um, you know, Engels puts um, Dickens to uh, shame, really, in his uh, <laughs> illustration of 1844 Manchester there. But this is what happens. And um, you can think of the, uh, you know, the third world now. You think of um, uh, places in Asia and, in, uh, and um, Africa that um, aren't too far from this. OK, um, so... Um, I touched a bit on the sort of um, relative surplus, um, cap uh, relative surplus um, capital there, uh, but also um, you know there's other things that you know, <laughs> that Marx touches on that I don't have the time uh, to do. Um, uh, imperialism, colonialism, primitive accumulation, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the creation of wants, needs, and desires. Thinking about um, you know fast fashion and uh, all the cheap crap that <laughs> we're told we want and need uh, and have to buy and thus has has to be made. Um, but I won't go into that. Maybe that's something we can look at in the discussion. But um, I want to briefly end. Um, yeah, I think I got the point on that one. I want to briefly um, end on um, perhaps two. Um, Two, um, two notes from Engels in the Dialectics of Nature, um, which I think um, sort of um, illustrate the, um, the, the uh, attitude of capitalism to nature, the free gifts argument, but also um, looking at some of the um, uh, looking forward. And I think this is particularly useful for looking at the green movement as well. Um, okay. What cared the Spanish planters in Cuba who burned down forests on the slopes of the mountains and obtained from the ashes sufficient fertilizer for one generation of highly profitable coffee trees? What cared they for the heavy tropical rainfall afterwards uh, that washed away the unprotected upper stratum of the soil, leaving behind only bare rock? In relation to nature as to society, the present mode of production is predominantly concerned only about the immediate, most tangible result. And I think you can all guess what he means by that. He means profit. Um, OK, so um, perhaps uh, I, 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 I don't say utopian because um, this is another argument. Um, uh, um, only conscious organization of social production in which production and distribution are carried out in a planned way can lift mankind above the rest uh, of the animal world as regards to the social aspect. Uh, that's key. Uh, um, in, in the same way that production in general has done uh, this for mankind in the specifically biological aspect, uh, historical development makes such an organization daily more indispensable, but also um, which every day uh, more uh, which is every day more possible. Um, from which uh, it will uh, date a new epoch of history in which mankind itself and which uh, mankind uh, uh, sorry uh, mankind itself and with the uh, and with mankind, all branches of its activity, particularly natural sciences, will experience an advance that will put uh, everything proceeding in the deepest shade. OK, so there's a few very interesting points in that um, final passage that I'll leave you on. Um, is um, um, this idea of, um, uh, that was very um, very known to Marx and Engels when they're looking at the capitalist, uh, the capitalist mode of production, is that capitalism, even in the 1840s, 1850s, uh, could produce everything that the world needed. You know, you think of factories, all the, all the stuff they were churning out. Um, so it was capable of doing that 100, um, you know, and 50 years ago. You think of the technology we've got now, surely, surely abundance is um, without a question. Um, but it, it's also interesting to see um, such uh, him say such 
such a, an organization is uh, daily more indispensable. Um, it's uh, it's the need we need to uh, have on the um, it's the goal. Um, okay, so um, I guess um, that sort of brings us to the the sort of um, bit that um, goes beyond my remit. Um, the bit that perhaps um, could foster a bit of interesting discussion is um, how do we take um, the analysis of capitalist um, um, influence on um, agriculture and nature, etc. It's been pretty bad. What should um, the uh, socialist, um, you know, how would we imagine that under socialism? In my reading group, I've been talking about um, News From Nowhere and um, I forget the name of the other one, but, uh, you know, some utopian plans and how they view the relation, um, relation of man, nature and labour. And um, it's all very interesting. We've also got um, they've some very bad <laughs> examples of uh, socialism and nature. Um, so in my very ironic and uh, aesthetic background, uh, just there is a great example. Um, so um, you've got in the, the foreground, a great, you know, socialist achievement and in the background towering industry. We've got things like, um, you know, actually, I think, I think that's a good example. Uh, you know, uh, that sort of imagery, particularly in the Soviet Union, particularly in Russia. Um, okay, how how do how does socialism going forward tackle that sort of um, that uh, the the needs sustainable needs uh, degrowth degrowth, um, but also how how do we tackle the green movement? You know, that brings up questions of horrible things like popular fronts and tailism. <laughs> but I'll leave all that for you guys. Um, hopefully, I've covered uh, a lot there but there's plenty there's more than enough to do, to discuss <laughs> if you want to get down to it um i'll leave it there okay thanks ali and uh just to remind comrades that there's um uh, a, a sheet with uh, various quotations and so on that ali was using and that uh, i think has appeared in the chat box and also um uh, is up on the LLA's education pages. Uh, before we go into uh, questions and discussion, uh, I'd like to bring in Steve Freeman. Uh, Steve is, uh, I think, working with the Republican Labour Working Group that was set up after conference. So if you'd just like to come in and make a quick announcement, Steve. Mute myself as well. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. And also thanks to Ollie as well. That was really interesting. I picked up quite a few things I didn't know about so that's that's uh, that's really good um yes we had the first meeting of the we had the first meeting of our working group on Tuesday as we was advertised on the Facebook page um and we basically had a, a brief discussion introduction on what is what is uh, what is we mean by Republican Labour we agreed that we would ask for submissions on the question of republicanism from as it were individuals and stakeholders uh, we thought we would put a, a month, we don't want this to go on too long, so we thought we'd, we'd try a date of the 15th of March. And we, we thought that we'd ask for maybe 200 words, which is not a lot, but we thought if people have a lot more to say than that, they could attach it or they could in some way we should go from the 200 words to something bigger if people wanted to, wanted to do that. But the idea was to get as many uh, uh, contributions as we could. We also said we would discuss some position papers on issues like republicanism and zionism and various other things republicanism and labor's democracy and things like that and then we also agreed that we would plan an educational series and i'm going to talk to kevin outside of this and and uh, about how we might do that but we've got next week we've got a meeting next tuesday which we haven't quite decided at the time but it'll be next tuesday and we will come up with some educate with an educational program plan there to be discussed so we've made some progress and uh, we're going to meet again next week. That's it. OK, yeah. Uh, thank thank, you for that. OK, and thanks, Steve, uh, for that. And it's good to see uh, comrades, uh, uh, you know, carrying out all sorts of activities in connection with the LLA. Um, not quite the same, but let a thousand flowers bloom uh, as long as they, uh, it, it goes all in the right direction. Um, OK. Um, 
I've got a number of uh, questions in the question box for Ollie, so I think Ollie can probably see them, but I'll read them out just to remind people. Um, Mary Dwyer has asked a question on the metabolic rift uh, while Ollie was talking, and I think he did cover it. But Ollie, if you could perhaps go back over that again, because I think it is quite a central idea, and it's certainly one that uh, uh, John Bellamy Foster in particular emphasizes. And um, you know that might be worth uh, discussing. Uh, discussing, and then uh, Esther Giles has uh, has got has made some comments. And again, I know from uh, our conversations, this is something that we've looked at. Um, and comrades have looked at in other spheres. She says, capitalism and intensive factory farming is presumably at the root of many zoonotic uh, disease disasters, such as BSE, avian flu such as the 1918 flu, swine flu, and, and you know, possibly there's even uh, some argument about uh, coronavirus, um, but I'm not qualified to get too far into that. And uh, Esther says, is this another symptom of nature in crisis? And I suppose the, the sort of little add, add on I'd, I'd add to that is of course, the relationship of nature and capitalism, that the crisis is not in a sense natural. Uh, which is one of the points that you you pulled out in your uh, in your talk. Um, now I think uh, I think there are also another um, number of other comrades who had their hands up, but they've now seem to have taken them down. I, I think Diane um, Issels had a hand up at one point. Um, so uh, do you want to come in, Diane? Oh, there you are. Good. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how how relevant to what Ollie, Ollie's saying, what I want to say is. Um, I'm on um, GM Watch's email, emailing list, and but through that, I got notified of um, um, Def, DEFRA's consultation on, on um, regulation of genetic technologies. That, um, it's... Um, because it's a, it's a um, uh, I was going to say ne neoliberal corporate um, move to to um, de deregulation. Um, uh, so, is it if you? Um, GMOs were um, regulated by um, e the EU, and we haven't been growing GMO crops here. And corporations that produce all this stuff are wanting um, gene editing treated treated differently, set claiming that it's just like um, normal um, na natural breeding, which it, it isn't. It's sort sort of re sort of relevant to um, some what. Um, Ollie was saying about um, factory farming and um, unnaturally bred animals because some animals get gene edited as well. So it, if any, anybody feels um, they've got, got time, uh, interest and ability to respond to that um, consultation, then I can provide information about it. Sorry, I've left it a bit a bit long. So I've known about it for a while, for a while, and the um, deadline for getting a response in is the seventeenth of March. Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely, totally against gene editing. I can I can um, give some information about some of the arguments I've been using. Um, so I I don't know. I can post some stuff online. Um, I, I don't know what what you do, what you'd like to do about it, and what you would like me to do about it to get it publicised. Well, uh, Diana, can I just suggest that uh, maybe it could be posted on the LLA's Facebook pages or the educational pages, and I'm sure Tina and other comrades who handle that will be able to do that. I. I mean, just a little comment, and maybe it's, I'm going to use up my position as chair, but um, it, it's actually an interesting argument about GM, because I was thinking in particular 
of Ollie's points about the way that um, uh, Robert Bakewell and others, um, uh, you know, bred sheep, you know, and indeed all of our contemporary animals are the products of, you know, conscious human intervention. And so I suppose the debate is about whether there are limits to that, and indeed whether we're talking in terms of uh, GM in terms of principle, or whether we're talking about the uh, uncertain effects of it. So I, I suppose the interesting debate is, is to compare the previous human interventions in, um, in farming and then to think about what are the limits to that. Um, and again, I, uh, I'm, I'm not scientifically qualified really to comment on that. Um, but I think it's an interesting question, Diana. Yeah, I'm not, I'm... sorry, I thought she was finished put her into the audience sorry diana i, I can't get her back quickly so um I think okay I then tina well i you were you were also down to speak so if you'd like to come in <laughs> as it happens i'm just <laughs> Yeah. Just kicked out the other person who was speaking i'm i'm sorry diana <laughs> okay um yeah i, I the, the 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 issue about GM foods and uh, is is interesting, isn't it? Because uh, I think there's very little actually of wheats or things that grow now that are you know natural and that haven't been um, influenced, have been made, have been remade, and have been changed by by human intervention. But yes, limits uh, setting limits uh, is an interesting uh, issue there, isn't it? Um, obviously, health would be an issue. Then there would be you know and and that companies. Uh, like Monsanto don't have much of an interest in making sure it's all healthy is, is, is quite clear. So, um, you know, you can't leave it to them, can you, to, to regulate these issues. Um, and there are other issues in terms of, you know, um, over, overgrowing uh, particular areas and that you have to, you know, have to land, has to, has to rest occasionally as well and has to be replenished, et cetera. So um, these are all issues that, Yes, uh, companies like Monsanto and so have no have no interest. Neither have the government, of course. It's so it's 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 again it's it's something that has to come from us. And that I think there's an issue where where lots of lots of people look to green campaigns and green parties um, to to help along with that. And you know, no doubt they have some useful things to say. But I kind of would like to hear a bit more from Oli about why why you criticized them sort of in a throwaway fashion you know I think it's it, it deserves um you know a, a, a better well a, another not a better critique because it wasn't the same that wasn't wasn't what was your talk was about but we have to be quite clear of the limits of of green politics and green campaigns because a lot of it seems quite a, a lot of common knowledge doesn't it um you like Corbyn and that means you also like the green party and can't the greens and and the left get together and you know we're all fighting for the same kind of thing well we don't really do we up to a certain point we are fighting for uh you know cleaner environment etc uh, etc et but clearly most most green campaigns or uh, extinction rebellion these these kind of uh, campaigns have a very limited range um which basically stops at the here and now i you know capitalism uh, you kind of try to to make capitalism try and you know get it into behave in a better way can't capitalism behave nicer and greener and can't we force it to and you know have laws on it and uh, etc which I think which is where where Marx indeed comes in and Engels as well come in really strongly, you know, because no, they can't. You know, capitalism is based on exploiting us all, as as Oli put it very well. It's exploiting the earth and exploiting us. That's what what capitalism is all about. So you know, you can force it to make slight tweaks here and there, but it it will get to its uh, limits very very quickly. Capitalism based on and needing to. Uh, constantly expand you know it cannot it cannot be run in a sort of ecologically um, sustainable way etc it gets to its limits very the limits of what capitalism can and cannot do very very quickly um, and also I, I think there's a there's a real issue with a lot of green campaigns and parties um, in terms of its what is essentially a kind of anti-human outlook quite often 
um, in that it's, you know, the, it's humanity's problem, basically, you know, we're, we're all to blame, you, me, we're all individually, you know, unless you recycle, unless you go to the package free shop and pay five times as much for your pasta uh, and, le- and your oatmeal, etc. then, you know, you're to blame for, for what, what happening to the earth and climate change, etc. every one of us. And unless I change, I cannot go around lecturing anybody on the need to overcome capitalism, which is a very common view and common understanding that you, that you hear. And it's profoundly wrong. It's, it's profoundly wrong um, that it's the, the, the problem of people not pulling their weight, et cetera. But it's a, a systematic issue. And um, I'd say that's, that's, that's where green campaigners fall down. And then they often have, of course, this idea that... Um, there's just too many people, you know, there's too many people and a sort of a Malthusian idea. We just, you know, have to like COVID, you know, some people welcome COVID because it sorts out, sorts out all these sick and old who are just sort of really, you know, taking up space and aren't really all that productive anymore. And it's, it's I've heard it quite, quite often by some people who I think are quite progressive, who think this is a quite a, quite a good thing perhaps you know I'm not going to say it openly but perhaps this is nature's way of sorting out the sick and those those unproductive forces of society which is quite it's quite a scary um, idea and a very a profoundly inhuman idea and mm-hmm. also um, you know misunderstands that it's no it's 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 not a good thing and it's not humanity's fault it's a, a and you know mulches and the earth is full up it's just rubbish it's not true you know we could feed the world 10 times over with the productive forces that that is at our disposal if not 100 times it's just the way it's distributed the way organi- um, production is organized is very centered in a few um you know developed countries etc and then there's places in the world where no bugger lives you know for miles and miles and miles all empty etc so you could we could you know live differently we could live in different places etc so it's so the idea of um, you know which which i believe the the green party in britain actually held until about 20 years ago where they had a sort of idea that the upper limit of how many people could live in britain was something like 30 million if i get if i remember rightly but it was something really dodgy and you know sort of cutting immigration and you know encouraging people not to have quite so many children etc that's how we're going to get it down i don't think they were going to in favor of you know killing people <laughs> i don't think they were doing that but they had a very profoundly anti you know sort of keeping it anti human you know keeping it keeping the numbers down and that's that's what the planet needs it's just really badly organized that's that's the problem with the planet at the moment cheers Thank you, Tina, for um, that uh, analysis of social Darwinism. I, you know, it, I have heard ideas about that, uh, certainly about the idea that uh, diseases are nature's way of dealing with humanity, um, which um, I think says a lot about humans and nature, our understanding of what, what those two are. Um, uh, Ollie, would you like to come back back in and just answer and make a contribution to the discussion so far? Yeah, yeah. No, t- Tina picked up a lot of uh, my threads there, um, so uh, I'm I'm glad on that. Um, okay. Um, I guess. Um, um, the thing uh, with um, Diane's. Um, uh, that Diane brought up about um, ge- genetic technologies and uh, GMOs. I thought Kevin, um, thought Kevin brought in some good points there. Um, and um, thinking about perhaps what Marx might have said is, um, well, you know, this is just a continuation of what's um, been going on already. And um, the part, um, the quote I read out before about, um, you know. Um, products of agriculture not just being the products of last year's labor but also of cumulatively generations of labor um that have gone into um transforming these creatures into their most profitable possible form that you could get them and it's something perhaps 
uh, perhaps I, um, I didn't uh, focus as much on as I, I probably uh, should have um, is that um, the, this metabolic rift um, is uh, essentially the argument is is that um, the these natural laws, as as Marx put them, um, these natural laws. Um, it's essentially um, capitalism bringing them into contradiction is the is the 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 general um, the general argument. It's stopping the the flow, um, the natural circulation of um, nutrients, to put it politely. Um, but uh, it's it's uh, we can all laugh and have a joke about it, but it's it's very important and it leads to some horrible results. Um, and, you know, as I've uh, illustrated in um, 19th century um, uh, Manchester, but also, yeah, um, it's uh, we've um, it also leads to the alienation of nature in all sorts of interesting and horrible <laughs> ways. Um, the cultivation of land that previously wasn't you know, farmland, most of Europe was forest and we cut it down and we put, you know, fields there. Um, okay, what happens when all this soil uh, loses its fertility? Well, we, you know, use fertilizer, um, uh, natural fertilizer to make it fertile again. Okay, well, we don't have too many animals, so we run out of fertilizer pretty quick. Let's go on a uh, expedition around the world <laughs> to find new ways of uh, keeping our food, um, uh, uh, keeping our soil fertile. Okay, well, perhaps we reach an upper limit of that. Well, you know, then we get into, you know, pesticides and um, GMOs. I think the thing with the uh, um, corn, I think corn, or is it wheat, it, one of the two, is about a third of the height, I think it's wheat, it's about a third of the height it, it used to be, because essentially, you know, you get too much um, hay for your um, wheat, so what they do is they cut down the amount of stalk, so you get um, uh, wheat that's like, you know, only a few, a foot or two, a few feet high, um, you can't run through it like Theresa May, uh, not like the good old days. Um, that's GMOs for you. But I mean, you know, the point uh, Kevin sort of makes about, you know, Bakewell is, um, I think, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting one. We mustn't, you know, uh, fall into the illusion that the nature around us is natural. A lot of is is created by, um, is uh, created by capitalism. Um, for its own profit. Um, for example, um, this is one a bit closer to home. I'm going to annoy a lot of people now. Dogs, uh, <laughs> dogs have been bred to be the way they are. Um, they're not naturally like that, unless you got like a dog, a wolf dog, or a husky or something. Like you know, um, they've been bred for specific purposes or wants, needs, or desires, etc. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's an example close to home, but GMOs is just doing it artificially. What they've been doing, what Bakewell was doing through selective breeding, you know, 200 years ago. So, um, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, Tina also mentioned sort of in passing about, um, you know, letting, uh, land lie fallow. And I guess that sort of the same argument about the um, Bakewell sheep, you know, instead of having a year when you just grow clover to make it fertile again to, you know, fix nitrogen into the soil, you just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, there's are, there's um, examples of that with, um, uh, what's it, um, with Ireland, you know, monoculture of potatoes, um, just growing and growing potatoes on your own plot of land uh, while the cash crops like grain, etc., you, um, you grow on the other land. It requires constant fertilization. Um, okay. Uh, and yeah, the green movement. Well, okay. I mentioned this in passing because hopefully this was something people would, uh, you know, bite on and, and, uh, you did, so that's great. Um, okay, I've tried to illustrate. I know I didn't get into the economics too much, but essentially the argument is is that 
capitalism is requiring uh, it first of all it sees nature as free gifts um so that's problematic because it means you you know you get you get whatever um but also it's got to expand and that's just the nature of how it is um coercive laws of competition means that you know as, as nice as capitalist wants to be um he's competing with other capitalists um and um so um he needs to make profits so he can reinvest capital so he can you know he'll be around next uh, year to uh, make more profits it's a cycle that grows and grows and grows um we can't really have a a, a green answer to that uh, of green capitalism because there is this just inherent um expansion within capitalism you know, all within the capital uh, argument. <laughs> it not only is it uh, one of the reasons why it's just so um, prone to crisis is uh, due to this constant need of sustainable growth of like three percent a year, and if not, then things get dicey. Um, okay. Um, yes, Kevin, you mentioned about um, in response to Tina there about um, some stickers uh, that uh, sort of went viral, I think, uh, you know, uh, humans are the disease, COVID is the cure. Um, I think that uh, did Extinction Rebellion in, in a bit with the PR front. Uh, but um, you do then get this sort of um, odd feature of the green movement that does contain bits of social Darwinism and also pure, you know, purism, like you mentioned, if you don't recycle if you don't uh, uh, all this then you're part of the problem me wearing these uh, jeans that i'm wearing they probably took about like what three thousand gallons of uh, of water um to produce and then you know they're dyed and that all mixes into the water and then they have special machines just to make them look worn <laughs> which then wrecks the product you've been making it's all very rational uh, there's also part of the green movement that, um, you know, you just get this ridiculous sort of answer to green capitalism is, um, oh, well, if we all just litter pick, you know, if we all just go on, uh, maybe we go to some beaches and, you know, pick plastic bottles. Well, for every one plastic bottle you pick up, be rest assured, a uh, hundred new are being churned out of a Nestle factory somewhere. Um, and reducing the population. Well, I don't know if anyone, you know, wants to go into um, degrowth, but if you want a sort of hippie, you know, uh, hippie sort of vision of the world where we all, you know, live with the land, man, sort of thing, you know, you're basically going to have to remove 99% of the population. <laughs> uh, it's just not feasible any other way. And in you end up reducing yourself back to the Stone Age, as well as sort of weird social Darwinist genocide. Um, so um, one of the whole reasons humans moved out of Africa, uh, or one of the reasons things went badly for when humans moved out of Africa at the end of the last ice age, um, is because animals were not were not able to cope with humans and humans just ate and ate and ate their way through the world and you know that's the reason we we, we we've covered so much of the globes probably because we just went around eating it um so the sustainability of um of um of of that um of the planet and humans essentially being too successful for nature um uh, i think Jack Conrad covers it very well in this uh, Weekly Worker supplement from uh, 2011, Weekly Worker 854. It's available on the website in text format. Uh, someone should get onto that. But um, yes, it, it, you can get it there. He makes the argument about Australia, mammoths in Siberia, etc. I think um, I think that's covered most of everything, Kevin. Okay, a uh, couple of other comrades now have been inspired to come in. Uh, first of all, Steve Freeman. Thank you for that. And uh, I've, I've unmuted myself. No, no, you're fine. Oh, fine, right. Okay. You, good. Steve. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah th thanks. Uh, thanks, Holly, for that. Uh, just one thing. Uh, this is like a question, but I don't think you covered the, you didn't really mention it a lot in all of this. Obviously, it's important. That is global warming. 
that needs to be discussed a bit more than you do. You've discovered many, just, just many of the ecological things. I, I won't try to go over what Tina already covered and you already covered, but just to emphasize this point and then add a couple of new points. First of all, this really is important to distinguish ourselves from um, what is green capitalism, if you want to call it like that, because the, the imperative of capital is self-expansion without limit. And that's a driving force. And that's why you can't get away from that. That's why it doesn't stop. It continues to drive itself forward in its pursuit of profit. And therefore it can't be slowed down. The idea you could just sort of stop growing, the GDP, GDP would go up, you, it can't be done because if, you, if, if the economy was to slow down, like, there would be mass unemployment, there would be absolute chaos, in fact, because it would spread all over the world and we would just be in total utter chaos. So degrowth, slowing down and all those other ideas are just utopian ideas in the face of capitalism. The only way you can slow down in that sense is to, is to get rid of capitalism. You know, that, that's, that's the answer. So... That's to emphasize what's already been said, comrades, but there's a couple of other points I want. One of the things just to think about it in, in terms of not the problem, not so much the problem of growth, but the problem of waste. And what capitalism does is massively waste resources. And you can think of some arguments here, like weapons and arms. The massive amount of resources that go into production of weapons and arms, which are essential to capitalism. And then you think about planned obsolescence, which you were nearly touching upon. Things are made to, to, to die out quickly so we can buy some more of them. So there's a continuous and continual waste. You know, it's a throwaway society, throw it away and buy another one. That's the essence. Well, how much waste is going on there? Is half of the production in the world just completely wasted production? But there are people who try to mend that, but people who try to do mend things. You know, there is, a, there is a movement of people who think all this waste is terrible, but there's a massive amount of resources. We could be all, the whole world could be a lot better off if we got rid of and, and planned it. Now, at least to the third point, which of course is the private nature of production, that you can't, the, capitalism are unable to plan anything. We cannot see the big picture. We cannot look at the world's resources. We cannot plan how the world should use its resources in a rational, efficient way, because it's all private production with everybody fighting with everybody else. And therefore you cannot plan the future. And indeed capital accumulation is based on things that have happened in the past, dead labor and all those other things. It's the past dominates the present. Whereas what we need is a system where we plan the future in order, to, in order to plan how we can make sense out of the present. So the answer therefore is getting, obviously getting rid of this unplanned system and get it and, and actually having, illustrating our arguments, how much waste is going on in capitalism, you know? So that's it. So just to remind you the global warming bit to come back on Ollie at some point, please. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, Alan Gibson. Uh, Alan? Yeah, just to, um, oh, on the question sorry. of how to relate to the wider uh, ecological movement, because I think that's very important. And if you look to the extent which young people are getting involved in politics, that's a very big uh, cohort uh, and are involved in that. Um, and I think that while I'd obviously agree that there are major problems with their strategic uh, approach to uh, the issue, which basically boils down to um, putting pressure on or um, trying to encourage um, our capitalist rulers to do the decent thing, uh, which as other people explained is outside their um, mode of operating. There are also at the same time, uh, I think opportunities for joint activity with the wider ecological movement, because there are many demands which make sense, which uh, are compatible with their viewpoint and a Marxist viewpoint. Things around um, campaigning for uh, free, widely available, electrically powered public transport, um, for a massive expansion of recycling facilities, um, for going one step behind recycling and for um, increasing massively the research into uh, replacing plastics, uh, which are in their almost entirety um, require fossil fuels to produce. 
um, for reforesting and rewilding of um, clear cut areas, things like that, which are a big part of environmental campaigns or things that we would agree with them could be around for joint campaigns with them. But the question is how we're going to convince them because the, the reason why the environmental movement looks to green capital with varying degrees of explicitness in the varying Green New Deal proposals. Um, some of those are quite radical. I mean, there's the ones put forward by the um, likes of Bernie Sanders or the ones put forward by the Labour Party in Britain under Corbyn. Um, but these are all still insufficient, obviously, because they are within the context of capitalism. So how do you convince the environmental movement that this isn't going to work? And we can, I think, make the arguments which people have made about um, the inherent nature of capitalism um, and that that is not an easy boat to turn around. But I think it's also important to look at the actual reality of what capitalism is doing, because it's not like that they're, they're not pretending. They have those massive COP conferences, and they call them COP now, COPs. Um, started way back in Rio in 91, I think, and we're up to about the next one going to be in Britain and in, in Glasgow it was due to be this year, but they post or due to be last year and they postponed it. They have those conferences, they make those commitments. There's the Paris Agreement, a meaningless agreement because it's not binding. And even then it's not sufficient. And along because there's a big argument that happens in the environmental movement that there's this big shift to renewables and that this will solve the global warming problem, which Steve points to. Um, but the problem is, is, is that other people have said that capitalism wants to expand. And yes, it's true that um, renewables are an increasing amount of the production of electricity, but it, fossil fuels have only gone down marginally. What's happened is expansion. And this has actually continued uh, during the COVID crisis, though it's decreased the, the rate of increase. So I think that's it's important to, when you're trying to engage with people in environmental movement, particularly young people, is to point out the reality. And one, one big thing is the commitment of international capitalism to, to not only continue, but increased exploitation of fossil fuels to the tune of trillions of whatever currency use unit you want. The idea that, which I've seen is that you can there are bad capitalists, the fossil fuel, fuel capitalists, mm -hmm. and then there are good renewable capitalists who want ecology. That's just a, a falsehood. Capitalism in the 21st century, or indeed since the Second World War, the middle of the last century, has been fossil fuel capitalism. It's completely intertwined. Completely intertwined. It's completely integral. To get beyond it, we're going to have to end capitalism. We're going to have to stop them from investing. We're going to have to stop them from using fossil fuels. And that's only possible by changing the social relations. That's the big task which confronts us is to convince people of that truth. Mm -hmm. So I've been interested in some discussion around that, particularly for, and this is a Labour Left Alliance meeting, and the Labour Party is problematic in that regard because the Labour Party Green New Deal version is as deficient as any other Green New Deal. So I'm quite interested in what people inside the Labour Party have as a perspective. Do, are you going to be raising a program to uh, end the private ownership of the processes of production, distribution, exchange, which is a necessary component of any possible future for humanity so that we can afford the catastrophic collapse, which is otherwise coming? Finish. OK, thanks, Alan. Um, Matthew Jones next. Come on. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, I just say uh, 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 it's been an interesting discussion. I think in, in a previous life as a sheep farmer, I would say that um, one of the things, of course, is that um, you know uh, sheep farming originally in this country and, and many places was not, there, and the reason for mutton, of course, is is not um, in, you know any desire to sell tough sheep. Uh, of course, mutton only, only usually goes into sheep, into meat pies, that, that's what it's good for. 
um, and actually it's about the change in in, in um, you know what you grow what you keep sheep for and originally of course keep sheep were mainly kept for wool uh, and these days of course they're mainly kept for meat so there's a total shift in that one the other I think that the interesting thing looking about agriculture the relationship between agriculture and capitalism of course is its incompatibility because of course agriculture if you if you ever ever uh, been involved in a piece of land or whatever agriculture is always the long-term business it always has you always work on the basis of a long-term plan uh, you know over over you know decades usually and of course capitalism doesn't doesn't facilitate that at all can't cope with that and so if you look at it actually the 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 the, 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 the there is a breakdown between the actual agricultural sector and 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 and, and the nature of capitalism and you can see this in terms of what's being done. I mean, in Europe, you can see things like the, the Common Agricultural Plan, um, which was, or the Common, sorry, the Common Agricultural Programme, which of course is a means of actually propping up agriculture and insulating it from, from the effects of capitalism. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, you, you know, basically trying to do that in a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an arm of the state. Um, you know, you can see it also in India with what's happening now, the massive farmers movement against what the government wants to do, which is to expose agriculture to, 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 to um, capitalist markets, as opposed to having a guaranteed price from the state, which is of course the Indian, the Indian version of that. Um, and of course, you know, what you've got basically are hundreds of thousands of farmers protesting and actually taking and um, staging massive protests outside of, outside of Delhi and, and then on Indian National Day invading the city. It's extremely important protest in world terms. Uh, has caused huge problems and, and has been running since since last November. Um, so I mean, I think I think we we, you know, we should point out, as I say, the key, the key point, um, you know, the, the, the agriculture as a as a as a method, in terms of how, you know the the operation of you know with 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 a, with you know, in terms of extracting a product from the land, uh, is incom incompatible with the function of capitalism itself. Um, and always runs into this issue. Um, I mean, you know, even down to the point where you say, okay, I mean, the problem, problem is at the moment, really, in terms of, I mean, what, what's actually happening now is, 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 is that farmers in Britain are being squeezed out because they confront this problem whereby, you know, they, 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 essentially the food, food processors will not pay. Um, uh, and so, you know, you can buy, you can buy cheap milk. But the, the, you know, even if you have a have a, a huge dairy operation and grind your, your dairy cows into the floor, you still can't make any money at it. Um, so, so in fact, what you're getting is a vast closure rate of dairy farms in this country, and that's carrying on. That process is carrying on. And so, you, got, you know, I think it's a it's really a fundamental point that we should make. We say, well, you know, the actual you know, any sustainable operation. Um, you know, it's not it's not compatible with the, with the mechanism of capital, and you can see this also in 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 the U.S. I mean, what's happening in the U.S. of course is that you move towards this sort of vast factory um, operation, where you know it's either, it, essentially what you you put the animal in the middle of an industrial process, and the animal never goes anywhere apart from from being fed or you know, uh, and then moving to you know, growing and then being slaughtered. So you have um, it, which then creates a huge, huge, huge issues of, you know, in terms of, you know, and then, then, then of course gets fed all sorts of things like hormones and disgusting things which essentially make the, the product um, dangerous, in fact, to human consumption. Um, so you find out, you know, and of course then you get the, the byproduct like the vast, vast amounts of manure and so on. So, forth. so you get the whole, whole areas of the US now are uh, polluted with, with pig shit. Um, this is a problem Danes also have. Well, they, they run a similar thing where they have just vast numbers of pigs and they would put shit. Um, and the US, of course, they just they just let run all over the place. Um, so that that's that's happening in, in places like the, the, the uh, I think uh, North and South Carolina, some of the and Georgia, and so on, where they've just been taken over by by this this intensive pig farming uh, in, in 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 the Midwest, where where you know. I mean, you know, the original sort of beef farming has now been taken over by feedlots where the, cow, the, the, the cattle never go anywhere and they get, just get fed hormones and so on. So you wind up with a situation where, you know, um, you have an, you know, an animal that does extremely badly, grows up, gets killed and then produces a meat which, is, which should be certified unsafe for human consumption. 
and which people, and certainly in this country, don't want, you know, don't want to eat American meat, but will be for, will be forced to do so uh, if if there's a deal, which is what the likes of Johnson and company want to do. Um, that they can then insert that that um, that that substance into um, the the processing lines in in in, in this country, and and and, and um, you know nobody can see the difference. And in fact, that's so. I mean, I think it's. I mean, it, it, you know, opening it up, it, I, I think you can you can pull that apart and start pulling out all that, all these different things. I think the problem, the pro real problem, in terms of the green movement, of course, is it has no. I mean, it has no because it's it it's essentially reformist and essentially middle class, and it it has no means of changing the system. And actually, all it does is adapt to the system. So you wind up the situation, you know, where essentially every time the Greens get anywhere near any, any kind of office. They actually just do what they're what they're asked to do. They never actually change anything. And actually, you know, you wind up in a situation where you get the German Greens now believing wars and uh, and, and imperialism and, and also and any time, you know, it's the same. Yeah, you, know, you can look at it anywhere because there is no, you know, because they're not socialists and they don't have an alternative society and they can't change anything fundamentally. Therefore, you you know, as a political force, it's completely it's just a dead end. Uh, and, and in fact, reactionary. Um, and you can see it you know, even in this city in Glasgow, you know, the Greens just go and go and vote for anybody. Going, they're they're in the council, they're in Holyrood, and so on. They just go and vote for any other kind of crap. Maintaining the current system, voting with cuts, keeping in in office all kinds of um, you know hopeless SNP ministers in Holyrood and all this sort of stuff. I mean, it, it is. And I think we should be we should be deeply critical of the whole of the whole business. And so you know, the point is out to them that unless they've got you know, unless they actually have an alternative, and an alternative proposing, inviting for an alternative form of society, they're not actually going to achieve anything. And actually, they just want to propping up the system as they've got it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Matthew. And uh, side of you as a sheep farmer that we've uh, not come across before. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mary Lynham now. You're, you're muted. You're muted. Right. And yeah, I, I can hear you. And I lower my hand. Yeah. <laughs> um, a very beautiful discussion. Uh, I had internet problems and I was scared I wouldn't be able to hear the rest of the meeting. Um, very um, beautiful introduction by Oli, who showed without naming it because there's no need of big words, but in fact what he demonstrated from Marx is the use of the, of the dialectical method, so that that relationship between the human and nature which passes through labour and in that way is dialectical because one changes the other mm. and back again. And then this keeps um, uh, keeps um, uh, the development of the hand. So even biologically, we are the result of this interaction between uh, our human uh, humanness and, and and nature. This this is very beautiful and very important because uh, this idea that everything is back to human nature is a complete. Um, uh, it shows the, the tremendous ignorance in which capitalism keeps people. It keeps people stupid. And so people say, oh, well, human nature is like this. And you hear that any time of the day, any time mm -hmm. of the week, uh, that the problem is human nature. And like um, Tina was saying, it ends up blaming people. So people, we are always guilty. Um, so about this, I would like to now bring this back to um, obviously there's a need now for the conscious, I think um, Oli mentioned the conscious organization, not only of production, but of life. So not just only conceiving how to make an object, but conceiving how to run a, a, a humanity and its relationship with nature. I think this is what Marx is about, if I understood well. And this consciousness, uh, it seems to me, uh, is linking up with uh, a comrade talked about, co how do you convince people? And I think this needs answering because in the Labour Party, you can go to Peter and to Jack and explain and it will be agreed and it has no, no effect. 
um, or it has only a very small one. Whereas in fact, what has an effect is that people are being poisoned and that with the um, pandemic, unless the whole of humanity is is, is taking action, we are going to have the, 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 the virus coming back and back. And so we need a conscious intervention as a human being, as a human, as a human, as a humanity, a, a conscious taking control of our life and our relationship with the virus and our relationship with the climate and everything else. Um, to, to, to cut a very long story short, I think that how do we convince people needs to come, we need to come back on this? I don't think it's going to happen like missionaries, you go out and you convince people with Karl Marx. It is not like that. It's just that Karl Marx has explained how it works and how it works is working in the sense that either we advance tackling capitalism and overcoming it, or I don't think we are going to barbarism. I think we go to extinction, which is the word that was raised by Oli. Extinction, this is where that goes. And so uh, we are obviously, as a humankind, we are obliged to confront the fact that is, we are not in, in a sustainable, I think it was Alan or Matthew who talked about uh, to change the social relations. Ah, yeah, but the social relations, you don't change them by talking about it. It gets changed, but like was done in the Soviet Union, by the change in the property relations. And I think this has not, this in general, not, not, not here, but in general, in all the debates of this kind, the question of ownership and property is not raised. And I think it is in fact the key to everything else. Mm -hmm. And we are going to be obliged to do it if we are going to actually confront uh, the big interest of oil. We have to expropriate them. And the pharmace pharmaceutical people, we have to expropriate them. It doesn't matter if I'm here to say it or if I drop dead, this is going to be necessary. And it will happen because it's necessary. And in that process, people get convinced because they can see how it works. And I think consciousness is something which develops in relationship with the struggle and the advances which we make against private property. So uh, in conclusion, you know, I, I don't know any better than anybody else, but um, I, I'm very excited about this subject. And um, I see that we are in a sort of prehistory where the, uh, the human being is eating itself up. We are cannibals. Uh, so it starts with the, the working, the, 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 the labor, the, the, the actual labor power, which is being cannibalized from people, from, from, from the mass of the population. It's a cannibalization. And this is applied to everything else, to the human being, to nature, and then uh, to, our, to our future, our future, which is, um, uh, which is being cannibalized now. Um, and so we are in a prehistoric situation and I think we are moving towards um, change because change is going to be unavoidable and thank you to all of you okay thanks uh, marie uh, i'll tell you i've been um uh, i've been indulgent as a chair uh, i'm good i'm going to just take in the last two uh, comrades which is uh, Anne and zbigniew so uh, if, if Anne, you'd like to come in and then we're finished with zbigniew and then ollie can sum up then okay so you, come, Anne. You, you thank you you want me to be quick and to the point not okay. at all, no, no, no. Okay, well, I've just been, I'm here in my kitchen. I've been out and I've done my recycling and um, put my rubbish in the rubbish bin and the recycling oh. paper in the other bin. And I really just want to, I'm beginning by saying that because I just really want to respond to Tina a bit because of course I completely agree that simply, um, individual actions in and of themselves are not going to resolve the problem we're facing. Obviously, the system has to be transformed, has to be superseded. But I don't really have a problem with individuals being conscious of the need to take individual action, because I think it means that they are conscious about the fact that the environment, you know, that, that the environment is something that we have to look after. Whether that's down to people picking up rubbish or 
um, you know, going to the beach and picking up rubbish, whether it's people taking care in relation to particular environmental issues. I obviously agree that the danger is that the, uh, they will think that it's enough to do that and they've, they, they've done their bit. But at the same time, it is making people aware of the issue. And I think that if people are aware of the question, then there's a better chance of winning them to a program of you know, environmental um, radicalism in, in the shape of you know, a part of a, a program for revolution. Because I think it's much worse if people are unconcerned. Um, and I think that we, as me, certainly as a communist and others who consider themselves socialists and revolutionaries, we have to explain the problems with our past because although I know at the very beginning of the Soviet uh, Union, there were some um, experiments and discussions around environmentalism, very soon with the advent of Stalin, um, you know, the situation became, you know, absolutely barbaric. I mean, mass production, everything became about production, 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 loads of waste, loads of, you know, um, environmental problems, you know, not least obviously Chernobyl, caused by the manner in which the economy um, uh, uh, operated. I mean, look at China today, like some people will call that a foreign worker state. I don't know what I'd call it, except, you know, that it's certainly not a, anything that's um, operating in favour of the working class, but look at the level of environmental problems there, um, because obviously, yes, of the market in that respect, but also in terms of the plan, the bureaucratic plan. Um, so I think that it's a better idea to relate to people in terms of their concerns, and yes, say the Green Party, well, I mean, we have a green. We now have the Green Party in government in Ireland. Every time the Green Party has been in government, it's basically sold out on even the mild um, programmatic demands that they put forward during the uh, uh, mass demonstrations and working class action around water charges in Ireland. The Green Party actually condemned the working class for refusing to pay water charges, um, and that was a time. That's interesting because that was the working class taking action and people became so aware during that of you know the relevance of water the fact that capitalism commodifies everything that around us including the air including nature so i suppose i think like just finally i just really want to say as a kind of corrective to what others have said is that i think that you can't just say bad 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 about people taking action, individual action about environmental issues. Yes, you've got to say your action in and of itself won't be enough and you need to draw lessons from the situation you're in where, you know, because in terms of the environment and, and fundamentally and finally, that you need to start to think about changing society in a fundamental way, a revolution. And actually what we need is a, a, the subjective factor, i.e. the working class organized in a party to overthrow the system. Anyway, thanks, Kevin, for indulging me. <laughs> hey, thanks, Anne. Uh, Z Zbigniew, are you still on the line there? I think I he... think he was thrown out of the meeting or something. I can't see him anymore. Oh, I'm right. Oh, dear. I don't... Okay. Um, okay, Ollie, if you'd like to come in now to uh, sum up, uh, there's been some very interesting questions and uh, some very interesting comments, so a lot to talk about there, I'm sure. Lots to talk about, yeah. Um, okay, so um, where to start, where to start? Yeah, um, in answer to Steve on global warming, I sort of focused on uh, what I could uh, grab out of Marx and uh, Engels um, and... Uh, they didn't really have much on global warming, sadly, but what we can, you know, extrapolate and pull out, um, it, it fits, you know, pretty well. Um, so we have, um, you know, uh, coal <laughs> uh, and oil. Um, obviously, we've got to power the, the big capitalist machine, as it were. But also, as mentioned um, by another comrade, um, 
the uh, the U.S. military is one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, single um, users of uh, of, uh, of oil. Uh, absolutely tons of the stuff. Why? Well, your big war machine with all your big, you know, Hummers and Jeeps, uh, your, um, uh, I know they're going for this nuclear, uh, you know, aircraft carriers and that sort of thing now. But, you know, that sort of thing, if you want to have an army on the move, you've got to go with oil. Uh, you can't be halfway through a battle and uh, need to charge up your, <laughs> charge up your, uh, your aircraft carrier. That would be awkward, wouldn't it? Um, okay, so uh, yeah, waste is a, um, a big one. Um, and it's something I would have wanted to talk about planned obsolescence. I think, you know, um, there's a great example, which um, light bulb. Uh, I'm pretty sure the first commercial light bulb um, was, uh, um, was actually on average um, uh, more life hours out of it you know, uh, before it burnt out than the average commercial one a few years ago. Uh, how do you explain that? Have we got worse at building light bulbs since? Well, I doubt it. I think it's probably more the fact that uh, we've uh, introduced planned obsolescence. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, an example that springs to desk, as it were, is uh, my headphones. Uh, these were the ones I got, uh, gosh, only a few months ago, and sure enough, I'm on another pair, and these are already half broken. Um, I don't suppose it's because I abuse them too much, um, although they do get quite a bit of use. I imagine most of it is probably due to the fact that it's, you know, crappy electronics, and you get lots of crappy electronics. It brings us on to the sort of uh, question of uh, creation of wants, needs, and desires, which capitalism has to do. Fundamentally, there is a drive towards monopolization within markets under capital. There's monopolization, um, you know, monopoly. Um, there's also um, problems of um, the more developed a market becomes, the sort of higher the entry costs of trying to get into it. So, you know, if you want to build a phone or something, that's a bad example, I'm sure, but, you know, there are a lot of capitals required to, to make um, sort of high-end electronics. Um, so as a capitalist, what do you do? Well, you do something else. Um, and if you can't, uh, you know, do something else, then you create something. Um, that's when we get this sort of weird fetish within capitalism of entrepreneurism. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. I, uh, I come up with things. I come up with ideas to make loads of money and sell you lots of crap you didn't know you needed because you didn't. There's only so many uh, human needs out there. And uh, if you go on, say, shopping channels or whatever, um, they're particularly potent forms of uh, the capitalist creation of wants, needs and desires. Um, you know, <laughs> um, I forget, what was it? So my sister used to have, uh, you know, an electric fork for twirling noodles. Just do it yourself. You don't need batteries to do that. Um, another one, there's a classic one of uh, America, is it? of course it comes out of America, it's a, you stick your stick of butter in it and you press the button and it automatically slices the butter, you know, the same amount of energy you require just to cut it, <laughs> but uh, this way there's no mess, we. Um, so yeah, all, the introduction of batteries into all sorts of things, you think of kids' toys, how much, you know, no no batteries included um i'm sure kids toys uh, you know just give them a box and some crayolas and they'll <laughs> they'll do just fine you don't need to give them loads of stuff with um uh, cheap electronics in that breaks after a few weeks which goes on to the point about waste and um recycling which is something that came up um the the sort of whole um gist of the argument is Capitalism is an irrational system. We can look at, you know, feudalism is an irrational system. Slavery is an irrational system. Even, you know, primitive communism, you know, outside of Africa is an irrational system. You end up killing off all the mammoths, etc. But 
what we got to deal with is creating a system that is rational, that does plan uh, for need rather than profit, something that capitalism, as I hope I've illustrated, with things like competition, with things like planned obsolescence, with things like creating new markets, the constant growth. Um, I think Steve mentioned the constant growth element. Um, you know, if you look at things like the Financial Times, they get very worried if uh, if things aren't you know three percent or above. Um, if growth stalls, that's a problem. It can lead to you know crisis um, for all sorts of fun and. Uh, fantastical reasons that you get in you know volumes one or two of capital that sort of thing um you know circuits and demand etc um but and the market but um it, you know just not going into that if capitalism is in a rational system i hope the example I, examples i've given in agriculture can convey that um what we need is a system of planning in the tour planning for need and um, not not simply uh, profit and uh, okay so moving on to alan's uh, point alan um, raises a very important program of program one might even say of demands and what type of demands we should um, we should uh, call for i think is uh, central to that is um can capital you know can we deal with these problems gradually um i don't think so i think you know marie uh, used the word she stole my phrase from my conclusion socialism or barbarism you know with every passing day engels in that last quote i mentioned is saying you know um a system of rational planning is not only becoming more and more possible every day but it's becoming more and more necessary every day. So yes, socialism or extinction, um, you know, um, barbarism, extinction. Well, you know, um, <laughs> I'm sure, sure. If, before we get to extinction, there'll be plenty of barbarism along the way. Um, okay, so um, that also brings the question of, you know, um, of um, how do we, um, how do we get the um, how do we get them off this Green New Deal uh, rubbish? That goes for the Labour movement as well. You know, um, people have mentioned the Labour Party. It's just insipid, the sort of stuff they come up with. Um, you know, um, very disappointing. Um, not just to young people, um, as I found out, but also older people as well. Not big fan of um, the sort of Green New Deal answers. Ditto Bernie Sanders and AOC. Um, I think... And it's something Anne uh, mentioned at the end. Well, I mean, we've got to have a, an organised answer. At the minute, the left is a bit in a shambles, um, you know, um, <laughs> um, inside and outside of the Labour Party. There certainly isn't any serious revolutionary answer. We're posing the question of a serious revolutionary change in society, but we don't have a serious organisation that's capable of doing a revolutionary um uh, change well surely the question of the demands that we put to people because demands can be inspiring it's not just a um, a question of uh, you know little by little feeding uh, people to more and more radical demands i think the environment is a is a question that um, poses a revolutionary answer and hopefully that's you know what i've been trying to get across um so hence i would argue we'd uh, and i don't think it's any any surprise uh, for comrades uh i think we it, it poses the question of a revolutionary organization that takes things seriously and um uh uh you know has a serious um a serious answer to this that's and people like serious answers by the way um you know um is 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 fun is tailing on a movement and you know getting your waving your placard around um, yes, we shouldn't just be uh, quoting <laughs> quoting Marx to them as I've been doing. Um, this is, you know, a historical indulgence as to the, you know, um, what Marx and Engels had to say on these things. But the uh, formulations they've come out with and the analysis they've come out with lead us to certain conclusions, and those conclusions pose certain um, goals that we need to address and uh, work towards and um, 
it, it, it opens up whole new questions of how do you organize a serious movement to to have a revolutionary change of society so i'll throw that one back at you uh alan um, <laughs> Okay, uh, Matthew uh, mentioned uh, meat as well. This is a big problem with global warming. Um, re um, Steve Freeman's uh, things, you know, cows are producing uh, lots of greenhouse gases. Um, it doesn't also it also doesn't help that we've cut down all these uh, forests throughout Europe and now you know <laughs> moving moving into South uh, South Asia and um, South America. Um, they can you know. Uh, forget um, just uh, going around South America getting all the guano for fertilizers. Now we're just saying, oh, sod it, we'll cut down the, the forests here where they lie and uh, grow soybean to feed our cows, to feed our meat. Uh, but again, you know, as mentioned with various forms of um, or with uh, things about animals and creation, artificial creation of animals, um, you know, this is. Um, this was something that happened mainly in the 19th century a move towards me in in ireland you had the mass mass um, eviction of hundreds of thousands of people um by landlords and what do you replace them with well you replace them with a few herds of cattle um there are reasons for this and it's a whole historic whole nother historical argument about uh, you know agriculture in ireland um the corn laws um um, evictions, that sort of thing. It's um, the potatoes, potato monoculture, the potato blight. Um, um, uh, imagine the rift on nature, but on a more genocidal scale. Um, yeah. So that's a that's another that's a whole other question. And uh, yeah, Matty Jones mentions uh, tick off chlorinated chicken. Yeah, <laughs> Brexit and all that. Um, okay. And yeah, the Greens, uh, this goes back to the question of reformists. Well, what it's not really um, often they don't end up reforming things, do they? They just end up doing capitalism with a green, green stripe, i.e. I think it was the Greens in Brighton who ended up being worse than the Tories when it comes to cuts. Um, so there's that. Uh, yes, the question of human nature is a, is a bugger. Um, the old... Um, capitalist realism if you will um everything that exists now is how it is and how it always has been is a problem and um, hopefully um if we take an actual serious historical you know dialectical look at things we can um we can do that um that's that's something that needs to be looked at um where's stuff and um i uh I, I find the recycling point with Anne quite interesting. At university, uh, we all gathered around one night to watch a documentary. Uh, it, was a, in, it was a quite well-known documentary, I think, about uh, recycling and the different categories of recycling or your plastics. And essentially, most of, you know, you, you separate your recycling and essentially what you're doing is you're separating the stuff that goes to landfill now and then you're separating the stuff that goes out either to an incinerator or a landfill later and it will generally just sort of end up on a in a tip in india or somewhere like that uh, so our flat stop recycling uh that's probably not the best idea but you know it's it's a point so but the problem of uh, individual acts is sort of a you know um awareness we need to be conscious of um of our relationship to nature that's something i think marie talked about but um then just sort of getting into uh, that you know we're getting into the ballpark of uh, you know reformism and uh, how we pose a, an act how we take that forward to a revolutionary um, challenge as uh, as anne was saying um and i'm glad um anne mentioned um the so-called socialist countries. Um, China was at a growth rate of something like 20% or something uh, for a bit, you know, year on year. And I know it was mainly a peasant, you know, agricultural um, based economy and then, you know, in, in massive industrialization, massive industrialization. 
it's now stalling because it sort of reaches uh, the uh, sort of uh, for various reasons uh, reaching limits but the whole point about capitalism and it doesn't matter what you call china you know state capitalist or you know china, socialism kind chinese characteristics or whatever the laws of the market here are applying and the laws of the market are saying growth 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 um you mentioned uh, the soviet union and um uh, particularly uh, Stalin uh, and waste production for production state uh, sake. This goes back to the thing I mentioned about the U.S. war machine. If you're in a state like the Soviet Union, which is uh, you know in a state of constantly um, having to keep up with the United States world hegemon uh, militarily, um, you know we can look at the good things that came out of it, like you know the space program and stuff like that. You know Yuri Gagarin. Um, um, and all that, uh, and all the women as well, uh, not forgetting them. But um, also, it comes with all the bad things and um, <laughs> digging canals with <laughs> with nuclear bombs uh, to build canals is a is a favourite. Um, so uh, actually, that reminds me. If you would just indulge me for one second. <sighs> A book that uh, when I first got into Marxism was, uh, was I think it's the first, second thing I read after the Communist Manifesto. It is the 1963 absolute classic, Fundamentals of Marxism-Leninism. It's the, um, the Soviet government's line on basically everything. Um, and it's got a very interesting passage that I think we all end on and think uh, about how a socialist um, answer um, yeah, I will shut up soon. <laughs> a socialist answer uh, will be uh, okay. So, um, bu -bu -bum. it is necessary to prolong lang uh, man's life to 150 to 250 years on average, to wipe out infectious diseases, to return non-infectious diseases to uh, to reduce non-infectious diseases to a minimum to conquer old age and fatigue, to learn how to restore life in case of untimely accidental death, to place at the service of man all forces of nature, uh, the energy of the sun, the wind and subterranean heat, to apply atomic energy in industry, transport and construction, to learn how to store energy and transmit it without wires to any point to predict and render completely harmless natural calamities, floods, hurricanes, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, to produce in factories all substances known on earth up to the most complex protein and also substances unknown in nature, harder than diamonds, more heat resistant than fire brick and uh, refractory than tungsten and osmium. Uh, more flexible than silk, more elastic than rubber, to evolve new breeds of animals and varieties of plants that will grow more swiftly and yield more mil meat, milk, wool, grain, fruit, fibres and wool uh, and, and wood that, uh, for the needs of the national economy. Ooh, God. Uh, to reduce, um, adapt for the needs uh, for life and conquer the un un unpromising areas, marshes, mountains, desert, tiger, tundra, perhaps even the sea bottom. Uh, to learn how to control the weather, regulate wind, heat, just as rivers are regulated now, hence the canals thing um, before, uh, to shift clouds at will, to, to arrange for uh, rain or clear weather, snow or hot weather. It goes without saying that even after coping with all these magnific magnificent sweeping tasks, science will not have reached the limits of its potentialities. There is no limit, nor can there be any, to the inquiring human mind, to the striving of man to put the forces of nature at his service, to divine all nature's secrets. I think that's the wrong thing to do. Um, <laughs> uh, um, perhaps um, a very utopian answer from the um, 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 from the uh, Soviet government there, uh, circa the tail end of Khrushchev. Um, very utopian, perhaps a lot better than uh, news from nose nowhere. A lot more, <laughs> a lot more uh, interesting and illustration there. However, clearly this is not um, 
this is not the sort of answer we have to control nature and subordinate nature to man's will. Um, clearly, uh, socialism or offer a perhaps um, more, uh, I won't say nuance, but um, a, a more um, a more dialectical understanding going back to what Engels said uh, you know uh, nature takes uh, we you know we inflict all this on nature um, but uh, uh, it takes its revenge so on that <laughs> grim note um, on uh, what we should do and how not to do it um, I'll finish there thanks Kevin Thanks everyone. Okay, uh, th thanks Holly and thanks to all the comrades who took part in the discussion. Uh, we um, we had, I think, quite a good uh, exchange of ideas, some very interesting contributions, and uh, I learned a lot. I'm sure a lot of other comrades did. So um, that's, uh, that's the end of the session this evening. Um, and uh, next week's session, I think, is me talking about Marx and the nation. And uh, that I think will also uh, prompt uh, some discussion. So I thank uh, comrades uh, for coming along. If you'd like to see more about the education program, uh, please go on to the website and the Facebook pages and look under LLA Education. So uh, good night and thanks very much for your contributions. Good night. Thanks.